Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we're going to be looking at the index fossils assignment. So the assignment itself is to do with the use of fossils in terms of dating layers of rock. So at the start of the assignment we have a description of index fossils and the objectives for the particular lab. Please read them. And then we come on to question number one. Now question number one is going to require us to make a fossil range chart. Now begin with, before we can start making the fossil range chart we need to actually look at the fossils we'll be using so if you come over here to page two you will see we have uh, pictures of several different fossils we have their names and we have the ranges so this is a ammonite and it's existed between the triassic and the cretaceous now just a quick point please note that this image right here has two fossils the shell itself is a nautiloid while the whole represents an octopod. So just bear that in mind. Now, once we've realized this, we can then start to use the information we have in this diagram here, or in this figure, should I say, to produce a bar chart, which is going to show us the ranges of our index fossil, well, of our fossils. So here is the diagram itself, it's on page three, and you can see this particular table consists of the organisms here, on the left and the geologic periods across the top. So how is this going to work? Okay, here we go. So let's look at the first organism here. Okay, so it's a gonotype and here it is here. And what's its time range? Well, it existed between the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. And so what we're going to do is we're going to shade in the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian boxes. Now, obviously, if you're doing this by hand, you'll use a pencil or a colored crayon. But obviously, as I'm doing this on Word, I'm going to go to Insert, Shapes, Rectangle, and then I'm going to simply fill in the box there, well, boxes. And then I'm going to give it the color. I'm going to go for green. So the next fossil is a uh, ceratite. So where's that on the diagram? Here it is. And the time range for this is Triassic. So once again, I'm going to select a rectangle. I'm going to come across the line. There's the Triassic. and I'm going to fill in the Triassic box. And I'm going to give it a color, this time a different color. So let's go for yellow. OK, and you're going to do that for all of the fossils in figure one. Now, I should just point out that if the fossil has quite a large range, like the nautiloid here, so the nautiloid appeared, appeared in the Devonian, and it comes all the way through to the recent. Recent means present day, so it's still around now. So for something like a nautiloid, the bar is going to start in the Devonian and go all the way through to the present day, the quaternary on the diagram. Please, don't do one box in the Devonian and one box in the quaternary, and then leave the space in between empty. No, one long bar, please. So, okay, so you're going to have filled out your diagram here. So once you fill out the diagram, then you're going to come on to part three, which is questions A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Don't miss the two questions at the top of page two, please. Now, questions A, B, C, D, and E will be answered using this diagram here. And I've got to be honest, they're pretty simple questions. I think you can answer them without me having to help you. Now, we're going to quickly look at questions F and G because they're, they're, they're a smidgen more complicated. So let's start with question G. So which fossils make the best index fossils and why? OK, so which, sorry, which fossil or fossils? So you're going to have to look at this diagram and you're going to have to see which fossil would make the best index fossil. Now, remember, the criteria for an index fossil are you want it to be common, you want it to be geographically widespread, you want it to fossilize easily and you want it to have a very short geologic range. So you don't want it to have been around for very long. So you're going to have to see which, using the diagram on page three, which one of these fossils matches those criteria best. Maybe none of them do. Then we have question F. So if you find a sedimentary rock that has no cephalopods in it, now please bear in mind all of these images here are of organisms which are part of the order cephalopoda, so they're all cephalopods. Can you tell which period it is from using the information you have been given? Okay, so using essentially this diagram here. 
So based on the information you have in this diagram here, is there any period in geologic time during which there are no cephalopods? So if there is you know, a period in geologic time where there are no cephalopods and your rock contains no cephalopods, well, then you can say, okay, there's a chance that this rock may be from that period of geologic time where there were no when there were no cephalopods around. Done. So you should be able to answer those questions pretty easily. All right, so now on to the second part. So the second part is going to be using fossils to actually date ages of, ages of rocks. So uh, as you can see, once again, we have the introduction and objectives here. Read them. Also, so part two also contains this geologic time scale here. Okay, it's quite crude, but it will do for the you'll do for the the uh, the, uh, the assignment. And we also have this table of data here, and we have pictures here on the final page. So the, each of these pictures corresponds to the fossils here. Now there are 15 fossils in this table. Each fossil is FAE1, FAE2, FAE. So FAE means fossil, and then obviously it's fossil one, fossil two, fossil three, fossil four, five, etc. So what do we have to deal with? Well, okay, so we can see that uh, on this diagram here, we have the abbreviations for the geologic time periods we have the geologic time periods here and we have their abbreviations next to them. Please note that some of them have interesting abbreviations. So the Cambrian is a C with a line through it. Okay, that's because the Carboniferous is simply abbreviated to C. So the Cambrian is abbreviated to C with a line through it. So if we come over here to the table, we can see, right, do we see that? There it is. Okay, down here. So fossil number, where are we? Fossil number 10. Okay first appears in the Cambrian, so you know, bear that in mind. That's what that means. We also have the Pennsylvanian. In this case, we have a P with a, a vertical line next to it. On the diagram here, we have a P with a horizontal line with it. So this means Pennsylvanian, and this means Pennsylvanian. So sometimes the line can be vertical, sometimes the line can be horizontal. Just don't get confused. They both mean Pennsylvanian. Okay. So anything else? Nope. I think we can crack it. Oh, one more thing. Sometimes the wording in this lab is a little bit interesting. Sometimes it will refer to the fossil as fossil one, fossil two, fossil three. And sometimes it will refer to the fossil as sample four, sample five, sample six. They both mean fossil. Okay. All right, so part A. So part A is dealing with figure one here, which is a sequence of sandstones, and we have a mudstone at the bottom here and a clay horizon, a, sorry, clay horizon, a coal horizon here marked in black. So, okay, part one. Uh, the upper sandstone, this layer right here, contains numerous large specimens of fossil number one. So what's the name of fossil number one? All right, here we go. Well, here's FAE1, so that's fossil one. The phylum, the class, and the other. The other is actually the name, okay? The phylum and the class, those are just what we use to classify the uh, the fossil when we're thinking about it from a uh, evolutionary point of view, okay? And in terms of, you know, the, the taxonomy of the fossil. But when it comes to answering questions in this particular lab, you are going to be focusing on the other column. So this particular fossil is going to be a Calamites. Okay. And then it's going to ask you for the age. Now the age you can get from this column here, which is called geologic range. And we can see that this particular fossil, Calamites, lived in the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. Okay. Now you are going to give me numerical values. So you are going to have to come to this geologic time scale here and you're going to, have to say, right, when did the Mississippian begin and when did the Pennsylvanian finish? So here we go. So the Mississippian began 360 million years ago and the Pennsylvanian finished 290 million years ago. So the presence of this fossil, Calamites, in this layer of rock says that it could have formed anywhere between 360 million years ago and 290 million years ago. Okay. So it's then going to ask us about the shale. 
and it's going to say the shale contains fossils of a primitive vascular plant that existed in the Devonian. What is the absolute age range? Well, so what absolute age range does this type of plant represent? All right, so find the Devonian. There's the Devonian on the diagram here. You're going to tell me when did the Devonian start and when did the Devonian finish? Once again, these are going to be numerical values. The final part of this particular question is note the orientation of the formation. Circle is this formation right side up or overturned. What does this mean? Well, most of the times when you walk up to a cliff face and you see a sequence of rocks, those rocks will be right side up. The youngest rock will be at the top and the oldest rock will be at the bottom. However, sometimes the sequence will be overturned. So the oldest rock will be at the bottom and sorry, the youngest rock will be at the bottom and the oldest rock will be at the top. OK, now in order to work out whether our sequence has been overturned, we will use what are referred to as way up indicators. So a way up indicator tells us is the sequence correct or has it been flipped? So way up indicators can you know, cover a whole range of things, things like, you know, we can use certain fossil burrows or we can look for sedimentary structures in the rock to tell us whether the sequence is correctly orientated. So in this diagram here, you can see, well, the mudstone, that's going to be pretty useless to us. There's not much going on there. The coal layer, that's going to be pretty useless to us. Now, the sandstone, on the other hand, you can see does have a sedimentary structure in it. You can see those diagonal lines on the diagram. Now, if you go back and you have a look in the lecture associated with this assignment, you should hopefully be able to work out what those structures are. And I hope, I'm pretty certain I did, in the uh, presentation I discussed how the thickness, the width of those particular sedimentary structures will change and how we can use that change in width to work out you know, whether the sequence is orientated right side up or has been overturned. So that should hopefully help you to answer that particular question there. Now on to figure B, on to figure B, sorry, on to question B, figure two. So here's figure two. So formation D, which is this one right here, contains a cephalopod like sample two. So sample two means fossil two, so fossil two there. Does the presence of cephalopod suggest is a marine or freshwater limestone? Well, the environments are listed here at the, uh, in the final column. So I'm sure you can just you know follow across and work out the environment. Formation E, this one here, is also a limestone. It yields abundant microfossils of sample three. Well, that means fossil free, so right here. Do these fossils suggest a marine or freshwater origin for the limestone? Once again, come to the environment column here. Question three, formation F, which is this one at the top here, contains angiosperm fossils like sample number four, sample number four, fossil four. Okay, what is the oldest possible age for this formation? Now, Let's go to the diagram here for a second. Let's say for argument's sake that fossil number four first appeared in the Silurian and is still with us now. So it's still here in the present day, the Quaternary. So that would mean, because it appears in the Silurian, the oldest possible age for this particular rock would be 435 million years, because that's when the Silurian starts. Okay. Is this formation right side up, overturned, or uncertain? Okay, now this one is a very tricky question. As you can see, we have a sequence of mudstone, limestone, mudstone, limestone, mudstone. None of these layers have any kind of sedimentary structure in them. So uh, that's not particularly helpful. So what else can we do? Well, we can look at the writing. So formation F, formation E, formation D. Well, that naturally makes us assume that because the writing is orientated this way, this should be the top and this should be the bottom. But no, that doesn't mean that. That's just the way it's been written on the diagram. That doesn't tell you anything. Okay. So is there any evidence that we can use to try and work out which is the top and which is the bottom of the sequence? Well, we have the fossils, fossil two, fossil three, fossil four. So 
obviously you can look at the fossils and you can say right you know which one's the oldest which one's the youngest okay so if two was the oldest and four was the youngest maybe what's happened is your sequence of rocks have just been tilted like that okay that's a possibility but there's also the possibility that your sequence of rocks aren't tilted like that they've been folded all the way over and you're actually looking at them coming at them in that direction because the layer the rocks themselves have been twisted and warped so you're looking at this bit here so the question is is from that diagram can you actually work out what's happened to these rocks i'm going to tell you now it's pretty tricky and so that should hopefully help you to work out whether the sequence is right side up overturned or whether we should be uncertain about whether the sequence is correctly orientated or not okay then we have uh, question c so question c uses figure three here there it is now it's a pretty diverse sequence we have limestones which are marked out by the bricks mudstones marked out by the lines we have sandstones marked out by the cross beds and we have a layer of coal as well so it's a pretty you know mixed sequence so okay limestone one this layer right here contains abundant coral like uh, contains abundant like coral similar to sample number five of course sample five means fossil five so fae5 what is the maximum possible age for this formation well find when it first appeared and then use the geologic time scale on page three to get that number and then is this a marine or freshwater limestone well don't forget that part of the question you just have to look at this last column to work that out so uh, limestone 2 this one here contains abundant fossils like sample number six fossil six what is the age of the limestone obviously when did fossil six first appear when did fossil six last appear give me numerical values question three what is the most likely environment of deposition for the cross bedded sandstone i think by now you should be able to crack that one yourself if you can't google question four what is the environment of deposition for the coral seam okay think to yourself where do we find corals in very large abundance question five is the formation right side up or overturned well this sequence does contain a sedimentary structure and you can use that to work out whether the sequence has been flipped or whether it's the right way up the sedimentary structure in question is the same sedimentary structure we were using for uh, the first part of this section so it's the same sedimentary structure that we've been using in this question here if none of the rocks contain fossils could you still determine whether or not the strata has been overturned well the answer is we've managed to work out whether the strata has been overturned or not by using something which isn't a fossil so i think you can probably work out question six for yourself okay so that's it for part one now there's also a part two to this lab so part two i will now open it up hopefully if i can find it there we go there's part two so part two is right here now the only reason I separated them is I because I wanted to get part two in a landscape orientation just so if you, you were doing it on your computer it would just be a bit easier for you okay so what part two is focused on is the use of uh, rocks in producing a very crude geologic map so how is this going to work well what you'll notice is we have numerous locations and new num uh, location numbers are marked out here and for each location number it's related to an environment an environment of deposition so 13 14 and 15 are associated with environment l and that's going to be a freshwater lake 2 4 8 10 24 are associated with environment m that's going to be open marine you will notice by the way that m turns up twice and t turns up twice okay that means these environments here and the environments here are the same so when you come to color them in on this map you will give them the same color okay so how are we going to do this 
So, okay, 13, 14, and 15 are locate our uh, environment L, so freshwater lake. So what we're going to do is we're going to color them in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come to uh, insert, and then I'm going to get confused. There we go. We're going to come to insert shapes, and you can cover them in rectangles. I'm going to go for a circle. And so I'm going to put a circle over 13, 14, and 15, and I'm going to give it a color, and I'm going to color it in yellow. Okay. And then going to put a circle over 15 and a circle over 14. All right. So I now know that those are all the same environment. Now for argument's sake, and this is for argument's sake, I'm going to say that location 6, 7, 12, and 16 are the same environment to deposition. Okay, I'm not going to you know, make one up. I'm just going to say they're the same. So I'm going to say that environment is, you know, uh, well, it is something, and I'm going to color those in, let's say, pick a color, orange. Okay, so there's that that and that okay so you can clearly see that as I go from this environment to deposition here to this environment to deposition here I clearly must have crossed a boundary mustn't I so what am I going to do I'm going to draw the boundary on the map so how am I going to do that well I'm going to go to insert once again shapes and I'm going to in this case I'm just going to use the freeform tool and I'm just going to draw a boundary between these depositional environments. So I'm going to put a boundary that sits between the two, somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to have a depositional boundary that comes up like this. It's going to come between the two. Now, unfortunately, because my Word uh, program is trying to snap the shape to a, a grid, it's not making my life easy, but there we go. There's the boundary. Okay. So this is the boundary separating this environment of deposition from this environment of deposition. Okay. Now you are going to color in all these numbers within the correct color. And so you're going to see that these environments are forming essentially chunks, blocks. And you're going to draw boundaries in between these concentrations. And that's it. It's, it's a relatively simple lap. But just please remember that location M and location M, M, so M occurs twice. The numbers here and here are going to have the same color. Don't color them in different colors. The same goes for the numbers which both occur in environment T. Give them the same color. Okay. I should also point out that sample locations 18, 23, 22, 31, 30, and 29 do not have colors. Okay. Just pretend they weren't there. All right. It's going to make your life a lot easier. And that's it. It's not a particularly difficult part of the lab, so just make sure you color in the locations. And once you color in locations, you're going to suddenly see, oh, there's a cluster of you know one color up here, a cluster of another color here. So clearly the boundary has to fall somewhere between them. And you're going to draw the boundary in. And that's it. Once again, save both these documents, part one and part two, and then of course put them into the Dropbox on D2L. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.